the Queensland Mycological Society acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognises the continuing connection to lands, waters, fungi and communities. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. As I'm speaking to you from the Sunshine Coast, I would like to acknowledge the Gubby Gubby people in particular, who are the traditional custodians of this land. I might hand over to Rebecca Degnan, who is uh, studying, and um, I might allow her to introduce herself. No doubt you've read the blurb. And uh, Rebecca, here's handing over to you. And thank you again for, for giving us permission to record. Thanks, Wayne, and thanks for the acknowledgement of country. And I'll also just acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on. So that's the Yagara and Turbul people. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I'm Beck. I just finished my honours in kind of molecular plant pathology a couple months ago, and I'm starting my PhD in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm a new member of the society. I just joined like a couple months ago. So this is actually my first meeting. So I'm excited to be here. Um, and yeah, today I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I was doing as part of my honors project. And it's all about um, metal rust and using a kind of mechanism known as RNA interference to try and control it. So um, in these photos here, you can see quite a lot of dieback. These are taken down just in Tarabadra Valley. And the dieback that you see in these photos is all actually as a result of myrtle rust, even on these um, quite old established trees. So um, yeah, the, my project was called RNA Interference Mediated Control of the Pathogenic Rust Fungus Ostrococcinia thidii, and Ostrococcinia is the causal agent of metal rust. And my project was supervised by Anne Sawyer, Alistair Taggart, and Louise Shuey. And I believe that some of you guys be familiar with Alistair already since he's spoken here previously. So the main aim of my um, project was to explore the potential of topical RNAi as a control strategy for osteopoxemia. And first, I'm just going to take you through some background about myrtle rust, and then I'll explain what RNAi or RNA interference is and how it works, and also how we've um, used it to try and control the pathogen. Uh, and then I'll just touch on kind of the methods we use for our experiments, and then some of the really exciting results that we were actually seeing. So, yeah, Ostrofoxinia is the causal agent of myrtle rust. It infects plants of the family Myrtaceae, about 2,000 species of which are native to Australia. Myrtle rust infects uh, primarily young or emerging tissue and can also infect fruit, flowers or seeds, impacting fertility and or reproduction. Symptoms range in severity from leaf spots and blight to um, whole tree malformation and mortality in more extreme cases. And additionally, many mitaceous plants are also of cultural importance due to their wide, ra wide range of uses from food and medicine to seasonal indicators. The impact of myrtle rust on the um, mitaceous industries is also significant. So the lemon myrtle industry at the moment is experiencing yield losses of up to 70% in untreated plantations. And damage in um, eucalypt plantations in Australia is currently minimal, but uh, yeah, wild, wide, wide scale <laughs> yield losses have occurred overseas and climate modeling predicts the spread of myrtle rust to new areas containing significant plantations in Australia. So in Australia, uh, myrtle rust has been recorded on over 480 species across 57 genera of Metaceae, and only 3% of species are asymptomatic. Uh, so as I said before, there are 2,000 plus species of Metaceae in Australia, so we do expect this number to increase as more species um, are monitored and screened for kind of their resistance or susceptibility. 
Metal rust related population decline has also been documented along with localized extinctions of rare and vulnerable species. And new research uh, published this year had, has also predicted an unprecedented extinction event of 16 species of native Metaceae in a single generation due to metal rust. So at present, over 50 species across 15 genera have been flagged as medium to emergency priority for conservation. And due to the foundational role of these species in important ecosystems, metal rust is considered a critical threat to Australian and New Zealand biodiversity. Um, at the moment, current attempts to control murder rust include the use of synthetic fungicides, breeding for resistance, and deployment of resistant genotypes. In the short term, these approaches uh, tend to have some success, but can be limited by things like pathogens overcoming bread resistance, as well as the high cost of chemical applications, and of course the downstream environmental effects of things like fungicide treatments. A recent example um, these limitations comes from the Brazilian forestry industry, where resistance was spread into eucalyptus trees until a new highly aggressive strain of Ostrifoxinia overcame this resistance in a number of genotypes. Additionally, having to repeat this process of breeding for resistance, um, if a situation like this does arise, is very time intensive and expensive. So fungicides are costly and they also forego they also force um, growers to forego their organic accreditations, and that can result in significant revenue losses, especially in the Metaceae industry. And since more fungicides are broad spectrum and non-specific, their use can impact the environment through loss of beneficial microbes, insects, and other organisms, making their use in natural ecosystems or ex situ conservation problematic. And considering the extensive limitations that current controls face, it's clear that a new solution, which is both effective as well as environmentally, culturally, and economically responsible, must be identified. So RNA interference, which I'll refer to as RNAi, is a gene silencing mechanism. This mechanism or pathway occurs naturally in almost all eukaryotic organisms. So that includes plants, animals, including humans, and even fungi. Uh, it actually evolved as a kind of defense mechanism against viruses and transposons, which are like these little genes that jump around in your genome causing problems. So um, organisms needed a way to kind of shut those down so they couldn't cause problems. And that's where this pathway evolved from. That's just a little side note. It's not that important. <laughs> um, the idea is that we can make use of this pre-existing pathway to silence essential genes in the metal rust itself. So we can kind of turn its own machinery back on itself. And that will ultimately result in death of the fungus or um, reduced pathogenicity and yeah, reducing incidence of the metal rust disease. So don't worry too much about this picture here. It's just an overview of the pathway, uh, but I'm going to take you through the important parts and how we use them on the next slide. So the first thing we do is decide which genes we want to target. So we want to pick genes that are really important that the fungus absolutely can't live without or can't infect without. And then once that's decided, we're going to synthesize these double-stranded RNAs. So that's the dsRNA. Uh, and we synthesize those in vitro, meaning in the lab. And we synthesize them with sequence homology to a target gene in the motor rust itself. So that just means that the sequence of this double-stranded RNA is going to be exactly the same as a little piece of the sequence in the gene that we want to target. So some kind of essential gene. Um, so for example, here we have our double-stranded RNA one, and that's gonna have the same sequence of nucleotides as a little section of gene one. So once the double-stranded RNAs are made, we actually apply them via spraying to the plant itself. And once on the plant, the double-stranded RNAs will be taken up into the metal rust spores. That's my very crude drawing of a metal rust spore. 
Um, and once in the spores, the double-stranded RNAs are actually chopped up by this little pair of molecular scissors called dicers into these small interfering RNAs. And these small interfering RNAs are just made up of little segments of this longer bit of double-stranded RNA. And then they join up with another kind of helper protein, which I've drawn as this purple blob. And that forms the RNA-induced silencing complex. So it's just exactly what it sounds like. It's a complex that's induced by the recognition of RNA, and it's going to go and silence genes. And then once that's formed, that's going to use those bits of uh, small interfering RNAs to find any bits of fungal mRNA that have the same sequence. So remembering that we designed those double-stranded RNAs to have the same sequence as some essential genes. So it's gonna go and find those essential genes and it's actually gonna deactivate them by degrading them. And once they're deactivated, the fungus is no longer able to grow or infect and that will stop the infection process and result in a reduced incidence of the disease. So in our study, we've applied this mechanism to the myrtle rust matase pathway system. And here's the system shown on a nice Melaleuca quinquinevia, which is one of my favorite matase. You'll notice that I drew it as well for the last example. Um, and we hypothesized that topical application of Ostrofluxinia specific double-stranded RNA would silence essential genes resulting in reduced pathogenicity of osteofoxinia and reduced incidence of the myrtle rust disease. So we started with these germination studies and we wanted to use these studies just to kind of gain a bit of an understanding of the optimal germination conditions and make sure we could get consistent results before uh, proceeding with kind of the more important experiments. And we found that the Ostrofoxinia spores germinated optimally at about 16 degrees Celsius and dropped off significantly at below 11 and above 20 degrees. Rebecca, may I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, Vanessa Ryan is asking, are the dices already present in the spore or are they introduced along with the RNA? So the dices are already present. That's a really good question. The dices are already present. All of the necessary machinery is already present. Um, yeah, most, most eukaryotes have this machinery. There are some exceptions that don't, but in general, you can kind of assume that they all have it. Um, yeah, so the only thing we're introducing is the double-stranded RNA. Wonderful, thank you. No worries. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do once we had kind of that germination temperature established is synthesize our double-stranded RNA. And this is actually a pretty time-consuming process. It kind of takes a couple months synthesizing in the lab before uh, you have enough ready to go for the rest of your experiments. And what you're seeing on this picture here, these black bands are actually all of our different uh, types of double-stranded RNA that we were using. And you can see from this uh, scale bar or size bar on the side <laughs> that they're all different sizes. And that's actually one of the things that we were interested in. So this second and third last black band, those are actually, um, different segments of the same gene. So one is just about double the size of the other. And that's just so we could actually compare um, if the length of the double-stranded RNA had any effect on kind of the efficacy of the treatment itself. Um, yeah, and so there's a combination of housekeeping genes, which tend to be the most essential ones just for basic survival. And then there's also some key uh, pathogenicity or regulatory genes and some genes which are highly expressed in the historium. So we assume that they're involved with that stage of the infection process. Okay, so now on to kind of the more exciting experiments. Um, one one, may I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. 
Um, so I think it's either David or Van is asking, how is the RNA taken up by the spores? Also an excellent question. And at the moment, it's um, quite unknown. <laughs> it's one of the things that um, the kind of community is looking into at the moment and looking into how the double-stranded RNAs might even move between plants and fungi. Um, yeah, it's one of those kind of big questions at the moment, but it seems quite likely that it's taken up during the germination stage, as you'll see from kind of some of our later experiments, it doesn't seem to be taken up until the spores actually germinate. Hopefully that kind of answers your question. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so these are our detached leaf assays, which is uh, the kind of the experiment that we started with. And one of the, um, yeah, these were one of the first things we did. And we started with a sterile Petri dish and we just used a low percent agar and petted a bit of that agar into this kind of crescent moon shape along one side of the petri dish. We used uh, Syzygium jambos, which is rose apple, um, as our Mertesi species for these assays. And we chose that one because it produces really nice um, pustules, really nice yellow pustules. So it's really easy to look at the myrtle rust infection process on that leaf because of that nice pustule development. So we just uh, detached these leaves at the pediol and then kind of dug the pediol into the agar a bit so they would could stay alive for a couple of weeks or kind of stay moist enough for a couple of weeks, long enough for the symptoms to develop. Um, and then in each dish, we would have one control and one treatment leaf. So the control leaf, um, we would just pipette just the Osteopoxinia spore inoculum directly onto the leaf, just a few drops, a few small drops. And then on the treatment leaf, uh, it would receive the same Osteopoxinia inoculum, but with the addition of one of our double-stranded RNAs. And that would allow us uh, to compare two leaves of the same age and growth stage, because that can also uh, impact what kind of symptoms you see. And we are able to directly compare the control treat to the treatment. So what we saw was very exciting and very promising. Uh, this is our double-stranded RNA3, which is one of our essential housekeeping genes. And you can see on the left here, the control leaf um, where we've prepared the inoculum, there's a lot of these yellow pustules developing, which is the classic myrtle rust symptom. And on the right, our treatment leaf, you can see that the infection is almost totally suppressed, which is pretty amazing. And we were very happy with that result. Um, so we also uh, did these detached leaf assays with a non-specific RNA. And that's to show that the that specificity is required for there to be an effect. So we used green fluorescent protein or GFP as our non-specific RNA. And basically, it's just not a gene that's found in Osteopoxinia. So we would assume that there would be no difference between the control and treatment. And um, that's what we saw here. So that was also really great. So these are kind of the full results from that, um, from that assay. And you can see all the treatments to the left of the dotted line here in green. Those are all uh, double-stranded RNA treatments that produced a significant reduction in the pustule number between the control to treatment leaves. And these ones to the right of the dotted line uh, did not produce a significant reduction. So in general, we found that our housekeeping genes uh, were the most effective and genes uh, which were double-stranded RNAs targeting genes which were highly expressed in the hostorium uh, tended to be less effective. And we also noted that when comparing that shorter double-stranded RNA with the longer one, the shorter one uh, was much more effective. I have a quick question, Rebecca. Yeah, sure. Um, Richard Boyne, who works in the herbarium up in uh, Darwin, is asking, were the S. jumbos leaves exposed to light after inoculation? Um, yes. So 
they what we did after inoculation on the detached sleeves is uh, firstly they were left overnight in the dark uh, which is a requirement for the spores to germinate and after that they were kept at 25 degrees in an incubator with a light dark cycle so it kind of is meant to mimic natural light conditions very good thank you no worries uh, so yeah, based on those results, uh, which we found were very promising, we wanted to try some further assays and see if we could understand further how or when or where the infection was actually being suppressed. So we came up with these in vitro assays and we were lucky enough to have access to these artificial leaves, which were provided by Dr. Grant Smith uh, and his colleagues in New Zealand. And these artificial leaves are basically engineered to mimic the tactile properties of a Mertesi leaf. So they were perfect for us to use. Um, and then the setup was pretty similar to those other detached leaf assays. So we basically just had on some of these artificial leaves, the control inoculum and on others, we would have the treatment inoculum. And then we would just be able to directly compare uh, any changes in the spore morphology or the germination rate. So again, uh, the results were very promising. I should also mention we just tried this experiment on the kind of four most successful double-stranded RNA treatments from the detached leaf assays. And all four treatments uh, resulted in a significant reduction in mean germination rate. In some cases, you can see this was quite drastic. And I'll also uh, show you some photos of what happened with the morphology, because that was kind of the really exciting part. But um, first, just over on the right here, you can see this is what the Ostropoxinia spore looks like. Um, and this is kind of the germ tube coming out of it. When it's a bit more progressed, you get some of this cytoplasmic streaming, which is just the contents of the spore pushing out um, through the germ tube. And then when it kind of all collects in the end, you get an apressorium forming. And in these kind of more advanced stages, you get an inf infection peg forming. So in our um, two controls, which were the no double-stranded RNA or negative double-stranded RNA and the GFP, we saw these really beautiful apressoria forming and infection pegs, and we saw a really high germination rate. And this alone was really cool for us to see because we hadn't seen it before. Um, so it was really nice to be able to see those kind of more advanced infection structures. And then, um, yeah, we saw in our four treatments that we actually didn't find any of these infection structures forming. So in the case of double-stranded RNAs 3 and 1, um, there was kind of an okay germination rate. It definitely was still significantly decreased, but some spores were still germinating. But when they were germinating, uh, the germ tubes were just growing very long and they were kind of with it at the end and they weren't able to form that apressoria or infection peg at all. And then in the case of our double-stranded RNA, two and four, the germination rate was much lower, particularly uh, in the case of double-stranded RNA two. And when the spores were germinating, they were just very short and stumpy and yeah, just couldn't progress past that. So that was really interesting to see. And these photos were all taken at 24 hours post inoculation. So very early on. And that's just some more photos because they're such cool photos. These were taken by Alistair McTaggart, by the way. I can't um, take claim for the cool photography, but uh, yeah, it's just an, some more nice close-ups of the apressoria and infection pegs in the control and then just the total lack of germination in the treatment. So based on those results, we decided to move forward with implanter assays. And again, we just took kind of our two most effective treatments or um, two that we wanted to kind of see how they would progress further. And again, we used the Jim Jambos, the rose apple, um, just for kind of its ease of use 
and we are used to working with it basically. Um, so we tried trialed two types of assays. We did these co-inoculation assays where the Ostropoxinia spore inoculum and the double-stranded RNA was um, inoculated simultaneously. And then we also did these protective assays where we sprayed the plants with the double-stranded RNAs six days prior to infecting them with the Ostropoxinia spores. And in both cases, we um, assessed the disease symptoms at two weeks post-infection. So firstly, looking at those co-inoculation assays, um, we found that both double-stranded RNA1 and 3 suppressed myrtle rust symptoms in planter. These results were actually even more promising than what we were seeing with our detached leaf assays. And in the case of double-stranded RNA3, we actually saw complete suppression of the disease. So we didn't see any incidence of the fungus on um, the Mertesi plants at all, which was really cool. And yeah, again, that we also trialed that with the green fluorescent protein just to make sure that um, the double-stranded RNA had to be specific to the genes we were targeting in order for it to work. So uh, then in the case of these protective assays, um, it was still quite promising, but probably needs further optimization. So we found that double-stranded RNA3, which was the one that worked best previously, um, did still significantly protect against motor rust, even when sprayed six days prior to infection. But um, double-stranded RNA1 did not have a significant level of protection. And the reason that um, these results were kind of not as good as when we co-inoculate co is because the double-stranded RNA actually degrades over time and with exposure to things like UV and rainfall. So these were just, these plants were just in a shade house. So they were being exposed to um, elements and watering every day. So we were actually quite surprised that there was still a significant protective effect at all. And um, in the future, what we would probably try is complexing the double-stranded RNA with a carrier um, just to increase the stability. And in that case, we should see a high level of protection against the rust. So as I said, we've got um, yeah, a lot of things to do in the future. Some examples, uh, we wanna look at RNA movement. So like the question earlier, we wanna try and kind of understand how the RNAs are moving, being taken up into fungi or taken up into plants, moving between plants and fungi. Um, this is quite like an interesting area at the moment for the community. We also wanna just increase our sample sizes and repeat experiments. Also um, expand our implant assays to a few of our other uh, double-stranded RNA treatments to see if any of them are even more effective than what we're seeing. We wanna use real-time PCR to provide a molecular confirmation of our results. And we'd also like to extend our assays to other at-risk Mertesi. So there's some species that have been uh, listed on the murder rust action plan, which need urgent protection. So we'll be extending, to, extending these assays to those species as well. And something else that we've uh, recently been looking into or kind of toying with the idea of is knocking out the um, machinery, the RNA machinery and seeing what happens then. So what we hypothesize that we would see is that if we knock out the machinery necessary for the RNA mechanism, then there should be no effect of applying the double-stranded RNA. It should be just the same as the controls because, um, and that would kind of confirm that this suppression is actually happening through the RNAi mechanism and not through something else. So that's also something else we're planning on doing in the near future. So yeah, our main finding was that Ostropoxinia specific double-stranded RNA significantly inhibits germination and reduces myrtle rust symptoms on detached leaves in vitro and in planter. 
we found that the double-stranded RNA does not need pre-processing by the plant, as in the mechanism seems intact just when you have the spores in vitro on those artificial leaves and the double-stranded RNA is being taken up directly into the spores and it's still stopping germination or um, the growth of those infection structures. We found that the machinery is functional and active in Osteopoxenia. Shorter double-stranded RNAs were more effective in topical RNAi. Housekeeping genes were more suitable targets compared to those hostorial genes. And uh, we also found that topical RNAi is consistent on detached leaves and implanter. So yeah, that's pretty much it. And I'd just like to thank my supervisors again, as well as the Carol and Mitter groups and uh, Grant Smith and his colleagues for the artificial leaves and the Australian Plant Biosecurity Foundation for their support. And thanks very much for listening. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was fantastic. Um, so rust, myrtle rust is a significant disease for us, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you were yeah. talking about a, a, an extinction event coming up. Yeah, so that was a, um, I was referring to a recent paper. Um, it just came out a month or so ago um, by some other researchers at the University of Queensland. And they have been doing a bunch of surveying I believe all throughout Queensland and New South Wales, and they had surveyed 1,000 plus populations of Myrtaceae, and um, yeah, they, they, their results concluded that there would be about 16 species going extinct within a single generation, and I think there was another significant number of species that were at risk of going extinct in also in a single generation. Wow. Well, that um, that makes this work very important, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a big problem and in New Zealand as well. Indeed. Well, that was really terrific and thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Uh, I have a question, if nobody minds. Go ahead, Vanessa. Yeah. Um, once you do find a really good combination, like you're thinking of using two or maybe three different things um, to attack the, um, the um, fungus, and solving the stable way of keeping it um, so it lasts longer on the plant. How do, in, how do you envision um, getting it out into nature? Because like, it'd be easy to just spray plantations um, and that, but like there's all these little nooks and crannies out there in the wilds that have these plants that need protecting. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, probably the main concern with this kind of technology. So there are some uses that are kind of more accessible. So as you said, like plantations, Matesi Industries is a big one. Um, another use that's being explored at the moment is kind of the use of it for individual sacred trees that are maybe very old or very sacred and need protecting and in that case, it can just be sprayed directly onto those trees. Um, in the case of using it kind of out in the wild, that's one of the reasons why we need to make sure that, um, that it, it is really highly specific because we obviously wanna make sure it's not producing any off-target effects and it's looking pretty good at the moment. Um, but yeah, you can also get the double-stranded RNAs produced kind of in bulk um, they make them up in E. coli and you can kind of just order them and um, and then the idea is you could kind of spray them in bulk similar to how you would with a fungicide but yeah in terms of using them kind of out in the rainforest or something that is that is still something that needs to be figured out but there is also kind of a big um, yeah, use for them in things like ex situ conservation or the nursery industry because at the moment, uh, the way that Myrtaceae are being protected from myrtle rust is kind of by growing up seed stock in these ex situ conservation areas or nurseries. Um, but often they have to use fungicides even to just 
get them to an old enough stage that they could then go and replant them again out in the wild. So if we could kind of get this to a point where it could replace that use of fungicides, then I think that would be a really good outcome. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. Still something to work on. Thanks. Eric, Eric was asking, thank you, uh, Rebecca, and thanks for the question, Manessa. Eric was asking, um, what is the solution of the spray with the DSRNA? Um, what do you what do you mean by that? Do you mean like what's the advantage of spraying versus another um, form of application? Or Eric, did you um did you want to? Oh, oh yeah, like just what's inside of it, like just to keep it stable and all that. Yeah, so uh, it's it's very simple at the at the moment. What we're using is literally just double stranded RNA in water. Um, so it's basically just a collection of nucleotides stitched together in water. And then if you want to stabilize it, you can complex it with a carrier. So one of the kind of popular ones at the moment is bioclay, which is um, otherwise known as layered double hydroxide clay nanosheets. And it's basically just little bits of clay. It literally looks like muddy water and it just binds to the double stranded RNA and then you can spray it like that. And then what happens is over about, I think it's about 30 or 40 days, the um, bioclay will just degrade into the environment <laughs> and it's nothing harmful. It's just things that are already there in the environment. So, yeah. Fantastic. Are there any other questions? Yeah, yes, um, this, uh, from the beginning, you said that you used double-stranded RNA of silenced gene. Is that right? Yeah, to silence yeah. the gene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to silence. To silence the gene, not of silenced gene. Is it to si use double-stranded RNA to silence the gene? Is it what you are saying? Yeah, yeah. So the double-stranded RNA um, is homologous to the genes that we want to silence. And oh, when we... Oh, yeah, 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 and, yeah. 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 Yeah, you get what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I thought you said that the double, double uh, stranded and I uh, of silence genes and then I couldn't work out what. <laughs> All right. Um, homologous. And then you get it from from plant or what? Where do we get the double uh, the, the origin of the RNA, yeah. So the, the double stranded RNA, the way that we... Um, synthesize that. Oh, you synthesize it. You're not screening in nature from, from a host or, or anything like that. So yeah, we, we pick the genes from the myrtle rust genome and based oh, on right. kind of other literature and things like that. Right. And then once we've chosen our genes that we want to target, um, right. then we just start with some myrtle rust RNA and mm. from there, it's kind of this big process, but basically you yeah, can then synthesize the double-stranded RNA you want with homology to that RNA. Mm. No, all right, all right, yeah. Thank Vanessa, you. I think, thanks, Ben. So I'm very grateful we've got some people who can um, whet their appetite on, um, on some cutting edge study that's happening. So thank you very much, Rebecca, I really appreciate it. Yeah, no um, worries, thanks for Do you have any me. other questions? Sorry, Becca. Oh, I was just saying thanks for having me and thanks for the great questions. You're very welcome.